So as I indicated, the theme for this semester's uh, series of events is borders and migration. And uh, we've had events that have approached to this really important issue from a variety of disciplines and approaches. Uh, and some of the ones we've had so far have, have looked at uh, historical phenomenon, whether it's uh, uh, British and American merchants in 19th century Russia or uh, post-Gold Rush immigrants to California. Uh, but today our focus shifts to something much more contemporary and critical, and, and that is uh, some of the ongoing dynamics of, of migration uh, between the United States and, and its close neighbors. And so we're really delighted to have an all-star panel here, uh, Professor Kif Augustine Adams, who's the Ivan Matus Chair and Professor of Law at the BYU Law School, where she's taught for 22 years. And in addition, three uh, uh, J. Reuben Clark Law students, Mallory Meekham, Blaine Thomas, and Carly Smith. And they're going to present on Women and Children in Crisis Volunteering at an ICE Detention Center. So without further ado, we'll turn the time over to the panel. Are any of you immigrants to the U.S.? Do you mind telling us where you're from? Honduras. Honduras. Okay. And anyone else? Anyone parent? Grandparent? Where from? Mexico. Mexico. And in the back? Canada. Canada. Counts. <laughs> Canada. Counts. Anybody, anybody over here? Okay. Germany. Germany. Italy, okay, how did, and this is a parent or grandparent? Grandparent, grandparent. and how did, that, how did your grandparent get here? Um, in the 80s, my father was a slave, and he came to New York. Okay, about what year, do you know? Uh, like in the 70s, so he was here in the Okay, and did they come with a visa? Oh, so maybe they were undocumented, out of status? Okay. Canadian, how did your family member get here? With a visa, without a visa? Visa, okay. Mexico, where's Mexico? Okay, so that's a way. Okay, Germany. Um, my great aunt um, worked as a maid for a governor in Utah right before World War II, and so then she was able to get visas for them. Okay, so she came on a visa. Yeah. Okay. So next week, the Women's Studies Honor Society will have a fundraiser for people potentially like your grandfather. Um, uh, and we're raising money for the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights, which is an organization started in Chicago. And they'll be showing of a film, the documentary film, on a BYU DACA student. Um, and that'll be in this room Monday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, 9, 11, and 1, and 10 and 2 are the, the times. And, I, and I'm asking you about these things. And you all know what DACA is. Does everybody know what DACA is? Okay, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. People who arrived in the United States without um, documents as, as children. And I want to make it clear that I'm using the language uh, without documents or out of status, lack of a visa, rather than the word illegal, because uh, for me, it's all a status issue. It's not whether or not people are legal or illegal. And in fact, the women and children that we assist in the South Texas Family Detention Center are here in order to claim asylum. And in order to claim asylum, you have to be in the United States. You have to be physically present here. And it is a right under international law, and it's also a right under treaties and, uh, and laws in the United States that they cannot claim unless they are actually here. And many of them enter without, without documents and without papers. So we have, I'm going to give you a super quick uh, introduction to asylum law. Okay. And so under international law and law in the United States, you have to claim asylum, political asylum, you have to be outside the country, your country of origin, and you have to have a nexus between the persecution that you have suffered in the past or that you fear in the future based on your nationality, your race, your religion, your political opinion, 
or your membership in a particular social group. And it's this last category, member in a uh, particular social group, in which most of the women and children at the detention center in Dili fall. So when they are fleeing violence in their home countries, Many of them come from Honduras, from El Salvador, from Guatemala. That's the vast majority of our population. But we also see in the detention center uh, women from Egypt, from Turkey, from um, Ecuador, from Chile, from Peru. Um, I'm trying to think of what other countries we've seen re recently. Roma, Roma from Europe, Russians. Uh, anybody else you can think about? Haiti? A lot, of, a lot of people from Haiti lately. And they arrive at the border, or they are apprehended once they've crossed the border, and they are sent for a few days to what's called the Yelera or the Perera, the icebox or the dog kennel. And these are literally, the, the Yelera is literally a concrete box uh, where the temperature is really cold. And then the Pereira is actually a cage, like the, the cyclone fence cages inside, inside a building. And then they are sent, some of them are paroled out into the United States, and some of them are sent to the detention center in Dili. There are various detention centers around the, the country. And this one is specifically for women and children. So if a family, an intact family, has crossed the border together, they'll separate off the, the husband. If there are adult children t traveling with the group, then they're sent to a different uh, different place as well. And in the detention center, um, our job is to help them prepare to present their, uh, their credible fear because we, that is the trigger for uh, being released from detention, paroled out into the United States to allow them to pursue their asylum their asylum claim. And remember, their asylum claim has to be based on past or future fear of persecution based on their nationality, race, religion, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So we are frontline legal triage. The uh, Cara Pro Bono Project is who we volunteer with, and they are on the ground in Dili all the time. And they have waves of students and attorneys coming in for a week-long intensive time. And uh, my colleagues will share with you a little bit more about what exactly it is we do in preparing the women to uh, have an interview with their asylum officer to talk about why they're afraid of returning returning to their home country. This is indeed an all-star cast. I want to start with Mallory Meekham because she has been the TA for the, uh, the Dilly Project f twice, twice now, and has been to Dilly uh, twice, um, twice herself. And we actually have a group going next week during our law school placement break. Uh, and fabulous Spanish speaker, okay. Then we have Blaine Thomas, who has been once, he went last fall with, uh, with my group. Not a uh, Spanish speaker, served on a mission in this same area in Texas where we go. Uh, and then um, Carly Smith, who is not a Spanish speaker, but who was brave enough to head down to the border with us and actually had a lot of opportunities, unexpected opportunities to use other language skills or to facilitate c communication uh, with, a, with a Russian population. So. Want me to stay here? You want me to stay there? No, up? you stay there. Okay. Um, so I'm Mallory Meekham. As Professor Augustine Adams mentioned, I have been the TA for the last two Dilly trips, so in October and then for the trip that's leaving. I'm not actually going this time, um, but I had the chance to go in August. Um, and my my journey to, to working, is this better? Okay, can you all hear me? To um, working in immigration law and to working with this particular population in Dilly is, is I feel like it's fairly typical of a BYU student. Um, I served a Spanish-speaking mission in Southern California. I met with a lot of people who came to the United States without documentation. Um, and the, I think I only knew one family through my entire mission that, was, that were US citizens or that had authorization to be here. Um, and so that kind of started me thinking about citizenship and what it meant to be a citizen and how I got so lucky as to be born in a country that allowed me to, to kind of go wherever I wanted. Um, but I was incredibly nervous to go and volunteer in Delhi the first time that I went. Um, in fact, I missed two opportunities to go because I was so anxious that I would go and that I would make a mistake or that I would ruin something for someone. 
Um, but I met with Professor Augustine Adams, and she and I had a talk about learning how to be brave and learning how to use your skills and abilities to be brave to help the people around you. That you don't have to do everything perfectly, but that if you will put yourself in a position to help, you will have the opportunity. And that is so true for me as I have gone to Dilly and as I have worked with this, this, these groups of people and as I have tried to help other people learn about the plight of the women that we work with when we go to Dilly. Um, and it's been so interesting for me to learn about them and to learn about their stories and to, to gain an appreciation for what they suffer in their home countries as they come here to the United States and, and the fear that they live with as they make this journey and go through this process. And the last time that I was there in October, I met with a woman who was telling me her story. Um, it was fairly typical. She'd been, she had been threatened by MS-13 in her home country. She was from Honduras. And she, um, MS-13 is a Salvadoranian gang that had come into Honduras at this point. And um, she was really upset. She was really angry that this group of people that weren't from her country had come into her country to tell her what to do. And it made it impossible for her to stay in her home country. And she just started ranting to me about how unfair this was. And as I sat and as I listened to her, she kept telling me over and over, I don't want to be here. I want to be home. I want to be with my family. I want my, I want my, my tamale shop again. I, wa I want to be home. I don't want to be here but I'm not safe. And that really brought home for me what this is about. This isn't about people who just are poor. This isn't about people who just don't like where they live. These people live in danger and in peril on a regular basis. And the only place that they feel safe is here. And, and how blessed I had been to sit in front of this incredible human being, to learn from her and to learn how to be brave from her. And I was given the opportunity through the legal skills that I had obtained to be able to be some small part of her story and to help motivate her and to realize that she could take control after she felt like she'd lost so much control in her home country. And it's, it's just been such an incredible experience. And if I could get, if there's one thing that I hope that you all walk away from this, this panel with is this understanding that we're, we're really, we love what we do and it's wonderful and it's helpful and it's amazing. But the people that really are incredible, the people that are really the stars of all of this are these women that we work with. These are the people that are strong. These are the people that are brave. And we're just part, a small part of helping them to learn that and helping them to understand that. How much time do I have still? So I want you to give a brief description of what you do to help okay. a woman talk about her the credi in the Credible Fear interview. Okay. So when they first come to the detention center, um, the women kind of go into like general population all together. And they hear about legal services through one another. They're supposed to hear about it in their initial introduction, but they don't really. Um, so it's word of mouth. So they will show up at the legal trailer and they come in and they, they have a credible fear interview, which credible fear interviews are just the baseline to establish whether or not they, the government feels that they have a fear of returning to their home country. It's a really low standard. If there's a 10% chance that if they return to their home country that they will be harmed, that can meet this credible fear standard. And so as volunteers, we meet with the women, we take all of their information, biographic data, everything, and then they come back to us a couple of days before their interview and we sit down and talk to them. And really all we're doing is chatting. Usually I sit down and I ask them how they are and I introduce myself, tell them how I learned Spanish. I remind them that I'm not from the government and then I say to them, why are you afraid to go home? And they will just start in with their story. And my responsibility as a legal assistant is to help them arrange that story so that it fits the very specific standard that Professor Axtianum's talked about when it comes to asylum law. Asylum law is very specific, it's very difficult, and these women are just telling their stories. And so my job, knowing the legal standard, is to help them to bring forward all of the most important parts of their story, all of the harm they suffered, and sometimes to help them understand that they have suffered harm. Um, frequently, they won't understand what that they have been raped or that beating is not legal. And so we have to help them to understand that some of the things that have happened to them, a lot of the things that have happened to them are wrong and that that shouldn't have happened. And it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of patience. 
because you wouldn't ever want to sit down in a room with someone and tell them about the worst things that have happened in your life when you've never met them before. And so as long as we can keep our, our focus on the women and help them to understand we're there for them, they can be more forthcoming with us. And then we get them all ready and we help package their story so that they can go and sit down in front of an asylum officer and answer questions appropriately so that it will meet those legal standards. Because when you tell a story first, you're not thinking about the legal standard, you're just telling your story. Um, and so we have the opportunity to help them to, to package that appropriately. So when one of the things that we say to the women and children when we first have an encounter with them, uh, in we have a, um, uh, Charla, um, uh, discussion. discussion. We have a, a main area discussion uh, with all of the women together and then individual, where we explain the basic principles and then go in uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis in some of the consultation rooms and talk through, their, talk through their individual stories. But what we say in that is that we as individuals recognize all the very valid reasons why they might have been unsafe in their home countries or felt the need to leave whether or not that was poverty, whether or not it was a desire to provide an education for their children, all sorts of reasons that uh, are valid, but that the law only recognizes those specific ones that, we, that I mentioned at, at the beginning, and that our job is to try and help them express their story in the way that meets the standard for the law, and that we feel lots of sympathy for all of the other reasons that they might have left, but those are not a legal basis for them to be uh, released from detention or to then initiate an asylum claim once they're once they're released from detention. I also want to make it clear that we're calling it a detention center. It's jail. And it's, we have a joke, I don't know if you guys called it baby jail, but we call it baby jail. Um, and there's been, there have been a lot of challenges to the t detention specifically of the children that they are in a inappropriate environment for, for children that, that they should automatically be released or not even detained in the first place. Those legal battles have not prevailed. The um, detention center, it's a for-profit center. We're calling it an ICE detention center, but it is part of the for-profit prison network that Civic Corps, Corps, Corps Civic now, it used to be called something else, has in the United States, and they make billions of dollars a year off profiting off of other people's, uh, other people's misery. Um, right now, the number of people in the detention center is fairly low. It's 300 to 500 or so right now. At various times when I've been there in the past, it's been closer to 2,000 uh, people. I think when we were there in the fall, it was closer to 1,800 to 1,000. To, to but, but it is jail. And when we go in, we go through the, um, we have to go through a security clearance in order to even present ourselves there. Then we have to, once we get there, we put all of our bags through the x-ray machine and if we don't have our clear backpacks, they dig through our bags and then we go through the x-ray and then they hand wand us and then we give them our license and if you have a, uh, an attorney with a bar card, you give that to them, they give you a pass. Then we go through another door and another door into the trailer. We're not allowed to walk through any other parts of the, of the detention facility. It's, it's kind of it's a compound, uh, unless we're escorted or have specific permission to uh, do that. We can't take our cell phones in. We can't take our have chapstick. You can't have chapstick. You can't have can't oh, bring no. in treats or water or anything for the the detained people. Um, this last fall, there was a new rule instituted. The other two times that I went, which was no physical contact. I can't pick up the kids anymore, which is what I used to do. I used to sit on, the, part of what we do is legal assistance, but part of what we do is sit on the floor and play with the kids so that the moms can have a time to talk with the legal assistants without you know, the three-year-old in the room or the, the 10-year-old in the room um, to hear about the suffering that they have uh, had. But new, new rule, can't touch the kids. Uh, you can hold their hand. I got in trouble when you I held hold. a hand. Okay. So just, and I understand some of those rules in terms of the limitations and uh, trying to prevent abuse and sexual abuse, uh, but if an adult woman wants to give somebody a hug after a positive result with an asylum officer, I think it should be okay, but we can't. If they reach in to hug us, we have to stick our hand out and say, oh, 
really want to hug you, but but I can't. You know the rules. So. Um, could you clarify how the detention centers make a profit? Because the government has a contract with them that pays them a certain amount of money. The contract for Dilly uh, wa is not based on the, the occupancy rate. It's a flat rate and it was done through non-competitive bidding, and it doesn't matter the population of people who are in there, they still get paid. So, all right. Okay, so I went, can everybody hear me? Okay, so, so I went to Dilly, and I had actually taken a class and learned um, about some asylum law from uh, somebody that's very knowledgeable about asylum law, and he told a a story to me, just just so that you understand how um, how difficult it is to actually obtain asylum in the United States. He told the story of a branch president in, um, I believe it was either El Salvador or Honduras, and MS-13s came up and told this branch president, give us all of the tithing money that you are getting on Sundays or we are going to um, d do harm to his family. That, that harm generally for children is they are um, taken and enlisted in in the um, in their military, they're called soldiers for the MS-13, and uh, other sort of sex trafficking, uh, murder. Um, so, so the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, is the murder capital of the world. Um, and you can read about it on uh, the Department of State country conditions. There's about 60 pages because we don't have time to talk about that. Um, but, but anyways this branch president, so he took his family, he wasn't going to give his tithing dollar, the tithing dollars to this gang, so he took his family in the middle of the night and fled to the United States, and he was denied asylum. So it, it's, it's not he had to be sent back. Um, it's not just that you have horrible things that have happened to you, they have to fit a very specific criteria. Um, and so when I went to Dilly, I knew that, that my purpose wasn't just to help them pass this credible fear interview and be able to see a judge. It was to help them find the, the parts of their, of their life that would help them to actually obtain asylum in the long run. And, uh, and it is a very, very demanding, um, it's very demanding to, to obtain uh, asylum. So, so anyways, I did about 30 credible fear um, interview preparations while I, was, while I was in Dili, and I since have done somewhere between five and seven on the phone. Um, and and it, was, it was very, so I was, I was one of the few men that was there, and I had to make sure to explain to these, uh, to women, I, I had to be, say, you know, I, I'm a man, if you are not comfortable telling some of the things that have happened to you, um, to a man, please let me know, and we can find somebody, somebody else. And I, I heard some very, very difficult things that had happened to people, and it was, it was, to me the 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 part that probably stands out the most was that at the end of each interview, when I felt it was appropriate, I let them know that I was I was here because Heavenly Father had led me to to be here. That, that I feel that I, I had been led to this place to help them and, and invariably they always started crying and they, they could feel that the love that Heavenly Father had for them but, but very horrible things had, had happened to these people. Um, and, and it was, it was inspiring to see what they had what they had gone through, these these women are are heroes to get their child and take a very dangerous journey to come to the United States. It was also um, it was also tragic to to learn the kind of things that that happen to people in the world and um, and and like Mallory said, I I don't believe that they are coming here to the United States so that they can take jobs from other people and. Um, you know, live like, like, they're in Disneyland on, uh, you know, like like Hollywood shows. I believe that they are that they are in fear for their lives and for the lives of their children, and they are coming here so that they don't have to suffer things that nobody should have to suffer. My experience was a little different because I got to work with some. Um, people who spoke more rare languages that weren't as common, so I did a lot of telephonic interpretation. 
Um, one of the most meaningful experiences for me was working with the Skiba family throughout the week. They came in early, um, and they were fleeing religious persecution in Belarus. Um, the most immediate threat to them, despite the harassment and victim, or vic they've been victims of crimes as well, but the state um, was using these charges that the parents weren't fit to take care of their children um, because of their kind of minority Christian religious beliefs. And these, um, this religion was also associated with some anti-government um, opinions, meaning, you know, he didn't believe in a dictatorship. Um, and this family, th their cousins, their nieces and nephews had been taken from them by the government. So there was an immediate pressure that they needed to leave. And so they fled to the border and, and were able to cross through. And their claim was successful. And it was really... Um, a really rewarding experience to have this first interaction with the family to explain to them what the process was going to be like in Dili and then by the end of the week to have them receive a positive um, credible fear interview and that was really rewarding I got to involve my home teacher who is very fluent in Russian to help me translate and talk with them and answer concerns and, um, and I'll, I'll re-emphasize the point that's been made several times that these women and children are truly incredible. They're brave and they take action and they're leaving situations that I think um, I might be personally like succumb to. Um, so the Skiba family was incredible. I also wanna emphasize just with this idea of borders, um, like the things that we're describing to you in the abstract, you might have a reaction to, but it's something totally different to be in a room with someone um, I, I got to sit in a lot of the interviews themselves with the asylum officer and to hear people tell their stories and to watch them sit there and shake and cry and be intimidated by the things that they're saying, all the while translating through a phone interview or through phone interpretation, um, watching the asylum officer maybe not understand everything that they were trying to explain um, or focusing in on points that were kind of irrelevant to their case or um, missing points that were really critical or having this arbitrary timeline in their interview. Um, there's a lot of procedural flaws that are happening. So that even if you have a strong claim, I don't think it's guaranteed that you're going to get through just because of the procedure and, and human failings. Um, so I, I came away with a much greater appreciation for the, the power of individual stories and individual interactions that can change your perspectives and feelings on policies uh, even in the United States. So my colleague Carolina Nunez and I uh, went to Dili in June of 2016. My husband and my middle child went with us as well. And we went to try and figure out if this was a project that we could take law students to. We were a little worried about the secondary trauma issues because of the stories, the rape, the murders, the uh, everything that that somebody would hear, um, and it was a it was a great it was a great experience to be able to provide some sort of assistance to the the women and children who were there. After that initial visit, I took a group in October of 2016 and in October of 2017, and um, m my colleague took a group in February of last year, and then she's taking the group again um, next next week, and. Uh, one of the things I want to be clear is that these detention centers started under President Obama, who uh, the policy beforehand was when women and children would come across the border, they would be paroled out into to their families rather than sent to a detention center. And then at that, as they were paroled out, then they would appear in court to make their asylum claims and to pursue those claims forward. They're not. Uh, Anybody who gets apprehended is going to have some sort of contact with the judicial system after that. Now, one of the fears was that people weren't going to be showing up at their, at their hearings, and that happens sometimes. But the, the idea that putting people into detention for two weeks, a month, sometimes much, much longer than, than that is the method to, to solve the, the, the problem if you perceive that migration as a problem, 
is um, a little bit irrational, right, because we're spending a whole lot more money to then uh, send people through these credible fear processes, and then ultimately, if there are lawyers present or legal assistants present, 95, 98% of them are paroled out into the community anyway. If there are not legal assistants available, then many of them will je just get deported straight back to their home country. But this is a, this is a relatively new policy in the United States since uh, late 2014 when there was a surge of migration from the Northern, Northern Triangle. Yeah, and that was a disaster when they did that. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you said that you started this in 2016, right? Yeah, I started going in 2016. Have you the noticed any differences since that order by President Trump? Um, I have not personally noticed the differences in the border, although we did have different, when, when I first was going to the border, all of our interactions with uh, the judges when I would go. So what happens is you have a credible fear interview. If you get denied, then you can, then you can go before an immigration judge. If you get denied there, then you can do a request for re-interview with the, the asylum officers, and there are different legal standards applicable to all of those. And it's only after that sort of that triple step that somebody should get deported back to their home country if they fail all of those all of those steps. And so, at least initially, when I <coughs> would be in court, it would be via video feed to a judge in Miami and all the interpretation issues <coughs> that applied there. More, more recently, the, the judges in Pearsall, Texas, which is quite a bit closer, it's just up the street away, are the ones who are handling the, the, delay, <coughs> the delay cases. But that was a disaster to move the judges to tho those border areas because then it meant that they abandoned all of the cases that were back in their, in their home jurisdictions. And many of them at the border area um, then didn't have much to do during their time frame there and then all of the cases back here were languished. Right now, the backlog for asylum cases and almost all sorts of immigration cases is like 500,000. It's just enormous. I'm currently representing a woman in Salt Lake who went through Dili. Uh, she was released from Dili actually about two years ago, two years ago next month. Uh, and she won't have her hearing before, she had an initial hearing um, but she won't have her actual hearing on the asylum claim before the judge until this September. Um, and so it was, it was 18 months out from the time when I started representing her. So what does what she do during that those 18 months? She lives in the United States. And I get her an employment authorization document. And she works. And her kid gets to go to school. And so that, that solution of moving judges to the border was 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 terrible. So w what I what I want to also I, I highly recommend to you a book called An Essay in Forty Questions. It's uh, if you can read it in Spanish, read it in Spanish. If you can't, read the translation. It's a woman who in New York City does the same. Uh, she doesn't do the same sort of work as we do, um, but she was a translator. She wanted to use her language skills to translate. And the questions that she would ask unaccompanied minors in the New York system, these are children who came to the United States by themselves, uh, are the same sorts of questions that we would ask people in, in Dili to create, help create their story. But I can't remember what her name is, but an essay in 40 questions. It's really, it's quite, it's quite powerful. And I just want to make the point also that just because people make it to the United States doesn't necessarily mean that they're safe that the MS-13, um, Barrio 18, those gangs have uh, infiltrated and made life difficult and caused violence throughout the United States, particularly in the areas in New York where she, she was working, and that the same sort of gang structures have been transplanted back into the United States. And I want to claim responsibility for the United States for much of the gang problem in Central America because Barrio 18 um, and, and um, MS-13 start here in the United States. And we deport, after sending them to jail, we deport the gang members in the 80s back to these war-torn countries, El Salvador in, in particular, where they then fester. So we've 
hardened, sending hardened criminals back to their home countries. And we sort of have this revolving problem of, of exporting, exporting violence or sending people back to home countries where um, they actually make the, the, the problem and the violence much more, uh, much worse. I also want to, um, I want to say uh, th there's a poem, and I don't remember all of it, except that be um, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, at the end of Hamlet, when he was playing it on Broadway, would, um, not Broadway, um, it was, I watched it, anyway, National Theater in, in London. Um, I watched it on, on a video feed, but he, he had a fundraising statement for Syrian refugees, and at the end of it he said that parents don't put their kids in boats in rubber dinghies unless the water is safer than the land. And you all know about the deaths on crossing the Mediterranean. Parents, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, 10-year-olds don't leave their home country to make the thousand mile trek through Mexico to come to the United States unless they think that it's more dangerous to stay at home than it is to try and, and make that trek where the sexual violence and the disappearances and the overall violence and the murders are, um, are safer than staying in their home country. So I just want you to think ab about that. Um, one of the most profound experiences for me was my first visit to Dili when across the table from me sat a woman with her 15-year-old daughter, and her 15-year-old daughter had that messy bun on the top of, your, of her head that you know is sort of the standard mode for teenagers. And my 15-year-old at home, she wasn't old enough to come. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let her into the detention center. Um, my 15-year-old at home had that same messy bun on her head. And there's no moral difference between that 15-year-old who was fleeing rape and sexual slavery and violence in her home country and my 15-year-old at home. And so when I say people are without documents, their moral status and their worth as human beings and their right to live without violence in their lives is no different for me or for you, whether or not your grandma came from Italy or your grandpa came from Italy or Germany or Canada, or whether or not you came from Honduras, or wherever it is your, however it is your family arrived, arrived here, and I want I want you to think about that as we, as w as you are in positions to make policy changes and to help people and to um, befriend befriend people in in your lives to that that we are all children, children of God. Yes, and, and my, my friend and freshman colloquium professor 35 years ago. <laughs> well, I assume can, that can, can, I, can I ask, that if, if we ask questions, can we use the mic so... This is being recorded, so, so just... Uh, I assume most of these people do not come with a, a lot of documentation. Nope. How do you prepare them to... For, for, to, to, meet, to meet a judge to prove that, that they are in danger, that they're their safety. I'm, I'm in, interested how that comes about. Okay. So at the stage that we're working at, they just have to be able to tell their story appropriately. So we're not developing their case beyond the actual credible fear interview. And because that standard is a subjective standard, so it's credible fear from the point of view of the client that we're working with, the documentation doesn't come out yet. I've had women pull out police reports. I've had them pictures, newspaper articles, stuff that they've carried thousands of miles from their home country that will be instrumental in their case at a later date. Um, the other thing that we do is we'll look up newspaper articles from their home country. It's awesome when you speak Spanish and you can find the local newspaper that talks about prob gang problems that they're having. Um, we use the State Department website sometimes to help with specifics that we need. Um, Blaine mentioned that. Um, so there, we, use, we use a wide variety of sources to sometimes help give specificity to the claim that they're making. Um, but the actual before a judge claim that Professor Oxy Adams was talking about when it comes to your, your hearing 
that's going to come later. Um, we're doing triage on the ground at that point. One of the biggest difficulties um, with preparing people for their credible fear interview is, is much of the harm that has happened to them is not, doesn't count under asylum law. So a lot of the gang violence, a lot of those um, extortion, if you have somebody come into your house and point a gun at you and take $2,000 from you, um, that probably doesn't count. So Although some of the lawyers in the broader context are working on developing particular social groups like small business owner. Some, in some um, circuits, those are more effective than in others, and you don't want to go to Atlanta. Yeah, so, so you're, trying, you're trying to help them make the best legal argument that they can, which means that you have to find, you have to find the relevant facts from their life. And um, as was said before, you have to explain to them. So I would, I would normally, uh, often people would tell me this whole uh, tragic story about why they left their country, and then I would, I would explain to them that um, if, if you were married in the United States and your uh, husband forces you to have sex, that that is rape. And, and then they would say, oh yeah, that, that's happened to me too. And, and so we, we, had to find the t we had to find details from their, from their story that, that mattered. And, and women as property, women who can't leave a relationship because of the violence, that's a category, a protected social, a particular social group, women as property. One of the perverse things about this whole endeavor is that we high five each other for bad lives, right? We high five each other. Oh, I just had this great case, right? Because, and that means it was the worst life you can ever possibly imagine. And that's perverse and that's terrible and we feel bad and we're also happy for her, right? Because now she's here and it can be something, it can be something positive. On the, on the credibility piece, part of what our training is, is not legal. It's, this is how you show confidence in the United States when you're telling your story. You look at the asylum officer in the eye. You present yourself, and, and a lot of these, a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of the uh, people are without education. They have been socialized when they're, when they're interacting with authority figures, not to challenge them, not to, um, not to speak confidently, just to keep their eyes lower. But we give suggestions, put your shoulders back, sit up straight, speak with confidence, speak directly, speak slowly, cry if you need to, say I need to take a break, What? but to speak in a way that people in the United States understand us, I am telling the truth. Hello, I'm Amanda, um, I'm a geography major. And I just had a quick question. Um, from what I understood, it sounds like when they get here, if they come here in like intact families, like the men are split off from the women and children. Um, that kind of like makes me wonder about when they go to face like asylum claims, do they have to face it separately? Like what if the husband, like, you know, they're, if they're in separate places, are they able to face it together? Like if there's a difference of opinion, like the husband isn't granted and the wife is, like what happens then? Yeah, so, so you can tie your claim to somebody else. So you could have, um, in, in court, it's, it, it happens a lot where you'll have um, a, a family seeking asylum and their claim will be, will be together. But they, they look at that, they look at those separate interviews and they see if the stories match up. And a lot of the times these people have had so many bad things happen in their life that they focus on different bad things. Within the, within the Dilly experience as well, sometimes we'll have children who will have a claim and that the mother will fail and the child will make it. And then, at least so far and now, they're allowing the mother to be released with the, uh, as a derivative of the child and, and vice versa. Most of the children's claims are derivative of the mother's. My name is Reagan. I'm a political scientist. I was just wondering, out of curiosity, what's about the proportions of even those that come from um, Latino countries, come from Central and South America, and those that come from the rest of the world? Because it sounds like you get some of everything, but... 
So the vast majority of them are from Latino countries, and they're from that Northern Triangle area. Um, I oh, had Venezuela. Uh, yeah, up. yeah. I was gonna say. I would imagine this time when they go this next week, they'll have more from Venezuela. Um, when I was there in August, I had quite a few from Mexico. Um, so that those other countries, it kind of you go kind of in and out. Um, I hadn't had Belarus before, so that was a new one. Um, but I would say, percentage wise, seventy five percent come from Latino countries in the Northern Triangle. And part of that's a geography issue, that you can walk here. Yeah. And you can't walk here from China, <laughs> or you can't walk here from Turkey. And so sometimes what people do, there were some Syrians there, sometimes what people do is they get to Mexico and then they walk yeah. from other countries. But, but it's, it's largely a geography issue mm -hmm. how you can get here. Um, just in hearing all of the sexual violence that does go on with these women and children, um, I'd just be interested to know your responses um, to those situations and if you guys have organizations or anything in place to help people that have suffered such severe um, sexual violence. Whether or not we we have organizations in place or whether or not Cara Pro Bono Project has? Yeah, um, the, yeah, Cara Pro Bono. Uh, uh, no, and we would not be allowed to do that in the detention center anyway. Uh, so we receive super minimal training on how it's appropriate to respond to that, not to re-traumatize, to, uh, but within the detention center itself, the government th via Core Civic is supposed to be providing all of those sorts of services, but there's not even a gynecologist on staff. Uh, and um, there is a psychologist and some of the, and, and some of the women are really great about getting the help they need through that, but there are long waiting lines and long, it's jail, right? Yeah. So uh, once they're out into the community, then it falls to there are other organizations that are out there to try and help with that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's a huge need. It's a huge need. Hi, I'm Beverly Unero. I'm a communications major here at BYU. Um, so my question is like, like a four-parter, I guess. So like one, like how old are the kids that like are considered like adult that are separated from 18. their families? 18, okay. And then also like, is it like just like family like mothers and children, like but like mothers without or like just single women, are they put into a different detention facility? Oh, so the single family. adult women, yeah. yeah, separated off. If you're traveling across the border and it's a mom and an, her sister and aunt and minor children, she'll be separated off the yeah. border. And is like all of these, um, the separations, like are all of them within that project, not just the women? So there are other organizations that do work at other detention centers, but other detention centers have different rules on who can go in and out. So Dilly, one of the strategies of, uh, of the government has been to put these detention centers in places that are inaccessible to attorneys, to families, to, to the public. And so the first one was in Artesia, New Mexico. Anybody know where Artesia is? It's like right near Roswell. It's near someplace? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much the middle of nowhere though, right? I mean, it's this teeny tiny town. How, how long would it take to get to Artesia from Albuquerque? Ooh, I've never been to New Mexico, but I'd estimate probably four hours or so. Yeah, okay. And Dilly is like that too. It's about an hour and a half southwest of San Antonio. There is nothing there. Then over in Carnes, there's another detention center. There's not even hotels to stay in. So, Dilly, we stayed in the, the oil field barrack, barracks. There are one or two, well, there are probably three or four fast food places. Hey, yeah. But Bobby's Tacos Bobby's called, Tacos. so we don't know where we're <laughs> Last question. Yeah, just really quick. So, I don't know a ton about this, but how does the Flores Settlement Agreement work with all of this? Not well. Not right. <laughs> so, the Flores Settlement was a lawsuit that was brought to get kids out of detention, and there was both a, there's both a five-day limit and then a 20, 21-day limit, and once you're in violation of the 
it, it, it is presumptively unreasonable to keep children detained for longer than 21 days. And we, so when, one, of the, one of the ways that the Cata Pro Bono manages this whole project, including the, you know, the waves of volunteers, is through a database called Law Lab. And we all, well, I do data entry for Law Lab, and there's a, there's a thing, you know, it, it, it automatically populates, and so you know when the four days deadline is, and it's violated all the time, all the time. As a super quick follow-up, um, is there any kind of like legal action that is taking place against that? Or yes, but it doesn't matter. So, no, I, 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 mean that, <laughs> I mean that both as a factual statement, but also as the limited power of law. That even if we have, we have terrible laws right now, but even if we have good law, ICE, Core Civic, eh. Well, and you have a really low level of protection for someone who's not a US citizen, who's crossed the border illegally. So the due process protections for them are basically Although the Fourth Amendment still applies. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right, I overheard a conversation that some of our panels need to get to class. Yes. So uh, we, we uh, please join me in, in uh, thanking them for a very interesting uh, conversation. Come, come to law school.